morning has been involved in East Asian medicine for over 25 years. He's known for his work in Zen Shiatsu and founding and directing the London College of Shiatsu. He lectures internationally and has published two books on Zen Shiatsu. Um, recently, Nigel dedicated his teaching practice to Kampo, the uh, Sino-Japanese herbal formulas, and is lecture lecturing currently widely on the subject. Um, please welcome Nigel Dawes. Certainly in the area of, of discussion about blood stasis and the resulting what we call doku or in Japanese toxins that can accumulate in the body. As part of what I want to talk about this morning, um, the workshop this afternoon will incorporate some practical work, particularly on the abdomen, because one of the things that is critical, at least in my practice, to trying to identify these pathogens, the existence of pathological fluids when they begin to accumulate in the body before they transform, before they become phlegm-like, uh, can be determined from abdominal palpation quite easily, as can blood stasis findings as well. So the use of the abdomen and diagnosis for these patterns is really, in my opinion, critical. And so that's part of what we'll be doing this afternoon, obviously, with a large group like this. We won't be able to do that this morning. So that's a little teaser for those of you who are interested in something practical. Um, and of course the other aspect is in this afternoon's talk we'll be of course getting into treatment and that is the discussion of the formulas and the particular show or zeng or confirmation pattern, however you translate that word, uh, of each formula in respect to the treatment of these two uh, systemic pathologies. So this afternoon is basically diagnosis and treatment. This morning um, I thought that I could touch on uh, some of the background of how at least one tradition, that's the tradition of Japanese herbal medicine, you know, has come to perceive, identify, and treat these uh, pathologies, and uh, say something about a few of the characters in Japanese developmental history who have influenced that thinking. Um, I'm trying not to get too historical on it. Um, and sort of get to grips with, you know, what do we mean when we use these terms, basically? What are we actually talking about? What do the symptoms look like? What are the etiology, what are the causative factors, and so on, of both what we can call tan yin zheng, right? Fluid, pathological fluids uh, syndrome, if you like, and uh, orketsu, which is a Japanese term for blood stasis. Um, just on a personal note, a couple of reasons why I got interested in this, I hope it might be interesting. One is that I did an audit, a sort of unofficial audit of my own practice, just for clinical reasons, I have no need to do more for any other reason. Um, but I was sort of curious to see, you know, you know, what am I prescribing a lot of, and uh, how often do certain formulas leave the office? I had some sort of anecdotal evidence. For example, my local uh, supplier on the East Coast was like, "Man, what do you do with that poison fooling one? Because you get, you order an awful lot of it." Um, and so I did this audit, and I actually traced back about a year's worth of patients and looked into the charts and uh, prescribing and so on. And I did, in fact, discover that I do prescribe 
a lot of blood cracking problems, yes, I do. In particular, ways of fooling wine, and I'll talk more about that formula uh, this afternoon. Um, so, and in addition to that, uh, a lot of formulas that contain classic, shall we call them, water manipulating herbs in one way or another, such as baiju fooling or maybe zooling as a shit. Um, so these are very commonly described, certainly by me, but not, of course, uniquely by me. The, the Kampa tradition comes from the application of classical formulas from the Han Dynasty, so primarily from the Jingo Yarui and the Shang Han Lun, and those formulas, if you know them fairly well, the majority of them do focus a great deal on circulating, moving, particularly the yang, right? Warming and invigorating the yang, which essentially means allowing circulation and movement to happen in the body more normally. And that includes, of course, at the yin level, the fluids of the blood. So I had this kind of revelation that, you know, I'm using these forms a lot. The second thing is that in my own studies, in my own interest these days, and I'm sure we all do this, is sort of go back over formulas that you are using with your patients in the clinic. So this is now sort of moved on a step from the classroom, whereby you're prescribing formulas that you're becoming more comfortable with clinically. And yet it's always useful, I find, to go back into the literature and have discussions with colleagues about those very same formulas. And certain indications that often crop up in various of the literature that describe those formulas, not all of which get explained back in school, right? How many of you, for example, you think of Mahong Khan. How many of you, example, of you, for example, have used Mahong Khan to treat pruritus? Itching. Anybody? <laughs> Interesting, right? How many of you knew that that's a standard indication for Mahong Khan? You may or may not. When I say standard, it's not a very common indication for Mahong Khan, but it's in the literature. If you take a Guedza formula, such as the one that uses a modification by adding Fuzi, Fuling, and Bai Zhu. Guizhe, Zhu, was it? Ling, Zhu, uh, Fu Tang, right? Guizhe, Jia, Ling, Zhu, Fu Tang. In that confirmation, which is basically a Tai Yan, Xiao Yan confirmation, there is also reference to myalgia, right? The treatment of myalgia and the treatment of pruritus in those apparently surface conditions has to do with toxic fluid. In the Ma Huang Tan Zheng, the Ma Huang Tan confirmation, the patient of course has chills and fever, of course has a pretty strong, vibrant, floating pulse, of course has all the signs and symptoms that we're familiar with They're in those early stages of the Tai Yan. But some of them will develop itching and uncomfortable feeling on the surface of the body. Why? Because they are a strong constitution, they're built like an ox, they can't sweat out the pathogen, Things collect on the surface, what things? Normal body substances that cannot move because the cold has trapped those substances. And essentially, fluids build up, toxins build up at the surface. It's not an interior pattern. It's not dangerous to them, but it's damn painful. They get aches, don't they? Terrible joint aches, muscle aches, but they also get this itchiness. That's a form of surface toxic fluid. That's an example of one of many efforts that I've been making in the last few years to try to go back into formulas and look at the little detailed indications and functions that are not so common and maybe not so obvious. The treatment of varicocele by Guedza Fool, for example. The treatment of um, amnesia by Da Chen Jitang, for example thinking of cases. And when you get, you look at the literature and you try to start to think about it, you have to go back to the basic functionality of what form is doing. And when you understand, in the case of blood stasis or fluid stasis, how the mechanism works, then you can trace back the reason why certain particular symptoms that may at first seem kind of odd, and usually in school, by the way, those symptoms are glossed over. It's like, oh, my old tongue, we know what that's for. Or just no mind that. That's something to do with it, but we don't really know. Right? So there are some symptoms within confirmations of formulas that I kind of glossed over because they're not necessarily discussed. So my two main reasons for getting interested in this area is I treat a lot of patients with formulas that treat these issues. And in my research and reading and, and study myself, I found that it really has helped me to understand the more obscure 
uses of certain very common forms. Um, which is another way also of saying that these pathologies, in my opinion, are really root pathologies. Once they occur and start to build up in the body, they start to affect so many dimensions of normal body functioning. So that in chronic disease in particular, and you can almost name any kind of chronic disease, at some level or another, one of these two things is going on, if not both. So that's why I got interested. Kind of. Clinically useful. Clinically useful. All right, so I thought maybe it might be useful to have a few historical perspectives, you know, where, where this thinking came from or how it evolved, particularly in the Japanese tradition. Um, you know, why did certain people focus maybe on this notion of fluid and blood when it becomes pathological in the body being such a core etiology? Uh, during the Edo period in Japan, which is something was a a high point in Japanese cultural development and certainly medical development. Uh, you could point to a number of things that were influential in the medicine also that came from and came out of society. They were what we could call interpolated, if you like to use the modern psychological terminology. Uh, something that culture kind of drags you into, sometimes kicking and screaming, but uh, uh, the influences of the culture on various aspects of human activity and medicine, of course, is one. What I'm talking about here is, in the other period, uh, the role of the samurai declined uh, in the presence of what was a fairly stable political period of about 250 years in Japan. Uh, the Tokugawa shogunates, um, basically, this is say, of course, the first shogun of Japan. That's a pretty picture of him. Um, these people were, you know, descended from the imperial line, or at least associated with uh, royal blood, and they were kind of the untouchables. They were certainly control and power. Below them, the, there were four ranks of people, the samurai being the top. Uh, interestingly, the bottom of the four ranks were the merchant class. Of course, they were the lowliest. Lowliest of the low. Below the peasants and below the artisans, The point that I like to make here, though, about the relevance of that is that the samurai were kind of, as you know from, I'm sure, some various movies, uh, and, and, and the most, more importantly, literature on the subject, their kind of military roles played down all during this period. And they turned their hand more to what were always also traditional samurai arts, which were the arts of poetry and calligraphy and painting and philosophy, and also medicine. Quite a number of samurai practitioners were also doctors. And their kind of philosophy, the Budo philosophy, the, the way of the sword, if you like, which then turned more to literally the way of the pen in some cases, uh, influenced the development of medicine a lot in a very kind of concrete, practical way. Uh, there's one saying in Japanese, uh, ron yori shoko, which means basically logic is more powerful, uh, sorry, logic is less powerful than fact or action, right? Or action is more powerful than logic, which you can translate a number of different ways. It basically means the show me mentality, you know. Oh, you think you, you say, you claim you have this fancy sort of technique. That sounds good, show me. Like now, <laughs> demonstrate. And this kind of focus of the influence of these, this philosophy into the medicine became very apparent because it, at this time we saw developing, particularly in herbal medicine, a very big predilection for, you know, practical hands-on approaches to, for example, diagnosis, the use of the abdomen and a kind of sidelining, not a complete throwing out, but a sidelining of a lot of the more elaborate uh, philosophical and theoretical uh, notions that were coming in or had come in from China. For example, um, this fellow, and this, he would be the best example of, the, of, of, of this kind of developed thinking, uh, Tono Yoshimazu, Tono Sensei, um, he basically, as a an infamous, almost, herbalist of the 18th century, he basically discarded all theories in herbal approaches to do with meridians or channels entered, flavor, or directional energies, or any of the kind of fibromal-based or energetically-based notions of what the herbs actually did. He was famous for his saying, you know, don't talk to me about what you can't see. That was his saying, you know, don't talk to me about anything that you can't see. So he was kind of, the abdomen is the center, we can feel that, 
The herbs get ingested, they go into the bloodstream. We know that. Let's just deal with herbal medicine as a, an application of a particular effect on a particular target. And his was, and that's why I've used him in this picture, his was a theory that later was transcribed or coined, if you like, into the phrase, into the phrase, uh, man byo many or in, you know, countless diseases, man byo, man is the, like from the Tao Te Ching, the 10,000 things, right, the, the countless number of diseases are, co are caused by, it doesn't say that, but ichi doku, one toxin. So many different kinds of problems can be treated as if they were caused by one particular toxin. And the, the question we have to ask ourselves here is, well, what, what do we mean and what did he mean by toxin? Because, of course, that's a standard change message term, du in, uh, in Chinese, like from Huang Menjie, du tang, right, or doku in Japanese. But it probably has quite a number of different meanings. And some of them can be very specific, like heat toxins that come out of the skin. And some of them might be rather general, as in a way of describing <coughs> any kind of pathological process that occurs within the body, which is, of course, extremely broad, almost like the term xie qi, right, or jiaqi in Japanese. Um, in any case, he was a big advocate of palpating the abdomen, locating the stasis, because toxins are associated with stasis, and purging, causing emesis, causing diuresis, sometimes diaphoresis, any of the terminology that we associate with getting something out of the body that either shouldn't be there or has been uh, kind of created as a byproduct of some kind of improper pathophysiology. So his term toxin was, yes, these are, these are actual agents within the body or the byproducts of agents that have affected the body that need to be gotten rid of, that need to be got out of the body before the body can even begin to start to reorganize itself in terms of uh, normal physiology. And that's why he was a big advocate. Of course, he had a lot of fights with the acupuncture community because he was like, you can't do acupuncture until you do that because if you don't get rid of the obstructions, acupuncture can't do that. That was his claim because he, you know, not all of us would agree with that, but he was pretty vocal. He also had a strong belief that the way in which you knew that you'd achieve that was not only by your assessment techniques and the arguments of changes and pulse changes and so on that we normally would expect, but that the patient would have a fairly and often dramatic healing crisis, we might call it today. You call it mangen, mangen in Japanese. It's like a, an obvious, you know, some people might call side effect. And he was kind of looking for that. He was looking for making the patient feel pretty damn uncomfortable. This was, a, this was one hell of a dude. He was pretty, you know, out there. Uh, he used strong uh, doses of Shanghai medicines, particularly from the Yangming um, section of the, of the, of the text, uh, but not only purgatives, also all kinds of other ways, slightly more subtle in some cases, of trying to get rid of things from the body. So he was one of the strong influences in this era period, in this 250 year period of Japanese thinking, certainly within the herbal community that really set the herbal practitioners on a certain track of focusing on certain aspects of how these toxins are built up. And that led very quickly to looking at, well, you know, how do toxins build up? Um, never mind the etiology, which of course can be exterior or interior, emotional, dietary, or of course the six evils or whatever. But once that occurs, once some kind of stasis occurs within the body, What's the typical route in which it takes? And it didn't take him long to suggest that within a very short time, what could start out as a yang pathomechanism problem, i.e. a problem of circulation maybe, let's say cold attacks the surface and circulatory impairment on the surface occurs, which is a form of blood stasis. That's not systemic. It doesn't take that long before if that cold penetrates a little deeper, let's say, cold the penetrates of the uterus. That it's not now only a case of the blood within the uterus not circulating well, which of course will lead to symptoms such as heavy, painful cramping, and possible dark, clotty blood discharge, and so on. But his point was that now we have the buildup of pathological blood. Not only that's causing those obstructions, but that itself is no good. It's 
what they call decrepit blood, or old blood, or blood that has no longer any function. And therefore, this blood must be discharged from the body. And he was pretty clear, in his opinion, that there were only two ways to do that. Menstruation and bowels, bowel movement. So how do you discharge old blood? Through the bowels and through menstruation. And so all of his focus in terms of the analysis and treatment of blood stasis was done through those methods. With fluid stasis, it's a little bit more complex because it's more, uh, it's less deep in the body, it's less circumscribed within the lower abdomen, which is where most blood stasis occurs. It's more spread. And he was therefore willing to consider that other than purging the bowels or causing strong bleeding during menstruation to get rid of toxins, that you could actually sometimes sweat certain things out or possibly cause a mesis, or maybe even cause the person to pee a little bit more and get rid of toxins that way. So in the case of water toxins, he was a little bit more flexible and a little wider in his application of formulas. So this was one character who influenced thinking a lot. Now, these slides I'll probably go over a little bit more carefully this afternoon, um, but I just wanted to demonstrate that through Chinese medicine history, it's not a new thing for there to be kind of, I won't call them fads, but you know, practitioners who you know definitely claim, oh yeah, you got to do this. If you don't do this, ah, nothing else is going to work. Right? We have a lot of those people today. Hopefully, not too many in the room, but you know, someone's might be a little bit inclined, right? But if you don't do this particular thing, you're definitely not going. And so, you know, I'll give you a few examples here. I'll race through these slides. This is Mubunsa, of course. Is, you may recognize this picture of Gavin from the 17th century. Uh, Mubunsa was the author and originator, but it's a bit of a myth about his existence, actually it's unclear whether it was him or his son, that first initiated the use of the dashin, the, the hammer, that you may be familiar with through Manaka Yoshio's work, or through Stephen Birch's work, or even, I don't think Kiko Matsumoto uses that, but there's a very wonderful practitioner living in Vancouver called Takashi Sensei, I don't know if anybody here knows him, but there are a number of Japanese, but only Japanese practitioners still use it, and it's a method of both diagnosis from the abdomen of xieqi, or jaki, um, distorted energetic patterns on the abdomen, and then a very gentle vibrational tapping of a small wooden mallet on the abdomen to scatter that accumulated jaki, right? And that will always be done at the beginning of every treatment regardless. So I'm just giving an example here of another kind of way of thinking that, oh, everything collects here, distortions are most magnified here, and in this particular way of thinking, this is where you have to start by scattering some of those distortions before you try anything else. Um, Gonzai Goto, who was, the, who was the actual father of the Kohoha, the classical school in Japanese uh, herbology of the Edo period. The Kohoha is the classical school, meaning um, basically they focused solely on the formulas from the Shangri-La and Jinbayaro in a very practical manner. His big, you know, this is what you're going to do first, is cheese stasis. Is the cheese stasis, everything begins with the stasis or the stagnation or the accumulation of chi in some or other or part of the body, and that's how things begin. Often, uh, as a cause of uh, either dietary or emotional kind of factors. And if you can detect it at that level and treat that first, then, of course, things won't develop. So his big emphasis in treatment was very much prophylactic. Had a lot of Qigong work that he did, a lot of breath work, a lot of dietary factors and exercise things that he claimed basically if you do this all the time, you'll never get sick. Right? This is not a new idea. Um, you may or may not have heard of Ishizaka Sosetsu, Ishizaka Sosetsu, who uh, currently has actually through Naki Kuvoto, who I haven't studied with, but Kuvoto come, I think he comes quite regularly to the West Coast. Um, a friend of mine, friend of mine, Dave Engstrom in, in, in uh, Seattle actually had him over recently. And he practices this particular style, again, from the end of period. And this is, this is radically interesting because, uh, including the fact that you can't see it terribly well, but he was alive a little later. You see his dates there in the later part of the end of period. And of course, that was a time in Japan where Western medicine or Western anatomical literature was coming into Japan quite strongly. And he was, big, he was influenced very, very much by that as a traditional acupuncturist, and he kind of focuses on the central nervous system in particular, and especially the spine and the spinal points, the paraspinal points, the quattro jaji points, asha points, and the urinary bladder points. And his treatment method was, and his treatment principle was, oh, toxins collect around the spine, from top to bottom. That's where they collect. 
and that's where they have to be released. So his technique was a one needle technique, scattering along and down the spine by palpating, finding little gummy points and in durations and things, and so only focusing on treating the spine. Another interesting. The Chinese part, you know, the other emperor, of course, uh, I'm not doing justice to 2,000 years of history here, but just a quick mention, clearly, the cold was the factor, right? Or cold, and actually blood stasis, and, um, and uh, as you'll see this afternoon, we'll talk about it. Zhang Zhongjing spoke quite extensively about blood stasis and fluid accumulation patterns. In the Jing Wei Yao Wei, there's a whole chapter on uh, Tan Yin Zhang, fluid accumulation patterns, their pulses in their treatment. And so he was quite detailed in his analysis of how that manifests in that treatment. Um, in the Sui Dai of Sun Tzu Miao, of course, you know, his big thing was the demons, right, as the alchemist. So you've got to clear these, you know, more the emotional side of things, how emotions get st stuck in the body, how they have to be purged, and ghost points and all that, amongst other things. Um, this is Li Dong Yuan, of course, at the Tarifying School, and then all of those four schools from the Jin Yuan period, they all had their focus, right? Oh, you've got to clear the heat from the body, otherwise, you know, that's the uh, Liu Wan Tzu, which is, was quite an interesting prediction, if you think about it, look at his dates, the late 12th century, and it wasn't until another 400 years later, three or 400 years later, that the Wen Bing School actually formally kind of, you know, formed through different people like Yi Chen Shen and so on. Um, but he was the precursor to that, saying that, oh, heat, that's, you know, when heat gets in the body, that's what you're going to get rid of, otherwise everything else won't work. Tonify the middle, Li Dong Yuan. Tonify the yin, which we, in modern China, now know a lot about, right? There's a big focus on that, these yin tonics that was born out of the school of Ju Dan Xi, um, and even uh, purgation school, which is more, more familiar to the, to the Japanese, actually. Um, so these are some of the Chinese ways of thinking. And in the Qing Dynasty itself, much, much, you know, almost 1,500 years after the, the, the uh, Han Dynasty, this is, the, this is Yi Chang Xue, of course, Yi Chang Xue. Um, this is the Wen Ding theory that gradually developed over about a 1,800 year period, so clearing heat from the So these are just background ideas of different parts of Chinese medical history that have sought to identify one particular aspect of pathophysiology as a form of toxin within the body that needs to be cleared. And uh, our focus is more on the blood stasis and fluids, but there have certainly been many others through history. All right. I started my time on a little bit. Twenty to twelve. Good. Okay. So, a little bit more about this fight. This is—I uh, don't know if anybody might recognize those pictures. Anyone been to Japan? Maybe to Kamakura. To be to Kamakura, which is the 12th century capital of Japan, about I don't know, maybe two hours southwest of Tokyo. There are a bunch of amazing temples and shrines. There. This is from Hasegawa Shrine, actually, and uh, I'm sure. Probably not that clear, but <laughs> in Buddhist iconography, there are always within temples and shrines there are there are these four heavenly kings of the four basically compass directions that are placed strategically in the four locations uh, of the perimeter of the sacred ground of the temple or shrine, and their job, of course, is to protect. And they protect from the north, the south, the east, and the west. They protect against the jaki. So a comment in terms of Buddhist iconography and Buddhist influences on the medicine, which is undoubtedly strong in Japan, very strong in Japan, is that in Buddhism it's very common to talk about the struggle between the evil chi, the distorted chi, the jaki, which is symbolized, if you can see them, by the little demons on the bottom that are being trampled on the foot there. These are ten toki and ryu toki, the two mythical Japanese demons in, in Buddhist law that actually embody evil chi, they embody the potential for evil. But what's fascinating about the story is that the four heavenly kings, the shitenno, the literally heaven-sent kings that are the defenders, who encounter and defend against the jaki, of course, were victorious. And not only that, but the jaki, the devils, were converted in Buddhist law to being good little fellows, and they become actually protectors of the Dharma. They become protectors of the teachings of the historical Buddha, the Shakyamuni Buddha. 
So, you know, a little bit of Buddhism there that, that just kind of, I, to, to me anyway, it strikes a big chord because it's like, wow, that's kind of what we talk about in, this, in, in Chinese medicine, this kind of fight. And, these, and I think it reminds me at least that the evils are not intrinsically evil. First of all, they have the potential to be converted, right? And cold is not an evil. Cold is a fact. Come and live in New York this morning. And it's there, and it's there to give you a hard time if you don't protect against it. Sure, if you don't take the proper measures, it's going to cause you problems. But it's not an intrinsic evil. Um, and certainly it can be converted. So there's a strong wall of Buddhism in terms of uh, you know, influencing the thinking in medicine. So with regard to the struggle between what can become toxic in the body and what starts off maybe not as intrinsically toxic, but as just a potential for being so. More specifically, then, what are these toxins in the body? Well, we can see water toxins, blood toxins, all right, ketsudoku, sudoku in Japanese. But we have to also include in the middle warmer the idea of stasis within the food or the digestate. So stagnant food becomes itself a kind of form of toxin. That can, of course, then get absorbed into the bloodstream and affect the blood and the fluids as well. And similarly, further down the gut, so both the stagnant food and the stagnant stools are part of, of course, intestinal stagnancy, um, but that occurs just a little bit lower down, uh, is a primary source of the buildup of some of these toxins. So this is a pointer to the idea that a, there are kind of two levels of how this happens in the body, typically, and that is that within the gut itself, which Western medicine also defines as an exterior, how shall I put that? A disease is not considered interior until it passes through the gut, right? And that's, in Chinese medicine, we say that too. Even though a pathogen that exists within, say, the stomach or the intestines, or the spring, not the spring, the stomach or the intestines, would be considered interior in the sense that it's part of the same food, right? Compared to the surface. However, still not part of the yin substances in the body, and therefore still considered yang. So the easiest place to treat stagnancy and therefore avoid the buildup of toxicity and therefore prevent the blood and fluid levels from being affected, says Campo, is to treat the intestines and to keep the intestinal flow as normal as possible. Anyone who works in elderly care is probably very well aware of this, right? Impacted bowel is one of the most dangerous and simple but dangerous situations for an elderly patient in the hospital. They may not be in hospital because of that, but when they have it, they don't get an enema or something quick, they're going to be in serious. Yeah, of course, you're going to reabsorb, you're going to start reabsorb a lot of toxicity unless you keep things moving. So on that, what we can call the yang level, in terms of etiology, it all begins in the gut. Once things pass through that gut wall, they could affect the way that fluids are metabolized and distributed, or they could affect the blood itself, the consistency of the blood, and of course the circulation of this is the mechanism by which toxins enter the body. Um, a little bit about fluid and a little bit about blood. Uh, and one sub-definition, if you like, in Campo is the general idea that water toxins can occur anywhere in the body, literally the interstitial fluids, under the skin surface, in the stomach and intestines, in the abdominal cavity, in various other cavities, the chest cavity, and so on. So that sweetoku is a very generalized term for toxins that accumulate all over and anywhere in the body. And the specific localized circumscribed enitacy, which is actual fluid accumulation in the intestines, which we diagnose in abdominal palpation. And that's localized very much. You could hear that by all percussion. Um, some of these interests, I don't think we have time to really look at these, but there's a lot of literature, I'll go over some of this this afternoon, there's a lot of very clear literature from the classics, I'm mostly drawing my quotes from the Jingwe and the Shenanlun, it's the most relevant to my practice. Uh, as I said before, the essentials, the Jingwe has this whole Tan Yin Shou chapter, and he says a lot about the pathomechanisms of the buildup of water fluids in the body and what kinds of symptoms they cause. Um, and as I already mentioned, there's a sense in which we can talk about a yang side of things, meaning that when fluids accumulate, then there's a circulatory problem, which we could call yang. But once 
there is absorption through the gut wall and the actual fluid consistency is affected in some way, either dried out or added to or accumulated, then we call it a yin problem. And then, of course, you've got problems that can occur anywhere in the body, including edema and other kinds of phlegm formation and so on. So there's a yin and yang definition. Uh, more uh, quotes there. Um, and this has to do a lot with how that spreading of fluid accumulation happens in the body, and it has very much to do with Sanjia and the Kuli, the spaces, what they call the spaces between, right? Which some people have translated as interstitial spaces. I think that's a limited translation, but nonetheless, yeah, we have to wonder, like, okay, if we talk about the Sanjia function, and we know spleen transforms, and we know kidney kind of metabolizes and excretes and recycles, and how does that more to get around? How do the Chinese think of that? Well, that's the Sanjia. And the Sanjia is the mechanism, and of course it has to include in Western terms the lymph system and the cellular structures that actually by osmosis change uh, uh, their water content and so on. So yes, of course, um, when we talk about Cooley, uh, the spaces, these are places where accumulation can happen, literally in every cell. Um, in terms of etiology, yes, uh, cold damages yang. And once yang is damaged, fluid will not circulate. So fuel accumulation, uh, particularly of the spleen and kidney, right? Particularly the spleen, the spleen and stomach. Once the yang trans transformation doesn't happen, fluids will begin to accumulate. Now in the modern TCM literature, I don't know why, but there's a strong focus on the use of the term damp in English and phlegm. And we certainly know that things can move that way. But I would suggest that certainly campus helped me relate to a much earlier pathological stage in which fluids accumulate where they are not yet phlegm-like, and in fact don't necessarily exhibit themselves systemically as damp either. And we would call that pathological water. It's a thin water. There is a term in Chinese medicine called rheum, right? R-H-U-E-M. E-U-M. Sometimes people talk about that, but mostly that's also kind of glossed over because we don't really know what that is, right? Well, that might be, have something to do with what we're talking about here. This kind of thin, watery pathological substances that can occur prior to more serious phlegm-like nodules or accumulations actually building up in the body. And they can build up all over. <clears throat> if it's on the surface, certainly um, in the orifices. Uh, there are formers, of course, that treat all that discharge of those thin watery you know, nasal and eye.